Our last speaker needs no introduction except to the EIS class, and uh, we thank you for giving up your Saturday. Uh, there are many stories about Bill Feige. Bill Feige has many stories, but probably the most famous is the village in eastern Nigeria he went to, and the response to vaccination was just enormous. And Bill, as being an expert in management, said, what did you do? And he said, I just told him, come get vaccination. Bill said, no, no, no. He kept going after the guy, and finally the guy said, yes. I sent out a message on the tribal drums, come see the tallest man in the world. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. I truly enjoyed last night in hearing the stories, and it struck me that one should actually do that several nights in a row for two reasons. Number one, to correct stories, or <laughs> because I don't want you to think I actually ate Don's cake. <laughs> what happened, Don and Bill Watson had offices next to each other. Don had this cake and asked Bill to make sure no one did anything with the cake until he could get a photographer there to take pictures and so forth. I was meeting with Bill, and he asked me if I had seen Don's cake. I had, but I said no. He said, go in and take a look at it. I ran downstairs to the snack shop. I bought a cupcake, and I came walking back and said, that is great cake. <laughs> The other reason one should do that is it jars your memory, and I thought of a dozen stories on the way home that I haven't thought about for a long time. One, as we had a flat in Anugu, our house helper came to me one day and he said, I'm not sure, but I think the neighbors have tapped into your power line, and so you're paying for their electricity. So that night... I went down and I turned off our power while he watched to see if the neighbor's lights went off. <laughs> I turned off our power line and half a city block descended <laughs> into... <laughs> well, as I listened last night to the stories and as we sang to Chris for his birthday, I thought about... Ty Cobb and his 70th birthday, he was being interviewed and pretty soon it went from an interview to just reminiscing about baseball and they were having a great time and Ty Cobb didn't like what had happened to baseball and the reporter asked him, if you were playing today, what do you think your batting average would be? And he said probably 290 or 300, which was quite a bit below his lifetime average and the reporter asked him, why would that be? Would it be the night games? Would it be all the travel, the artificial turf, the new pictures? He said, well, the main reason would be I'm 70 years old. <laughs> so most, most of us are in that range now, and we know it's easier to get older than to get wiser. And the question as we conclude this session is a search for wisdom. What does this all mean? Samuel Johnson once said, you cannot tell the precise moment when a fr friendship develops. He said, it's like a glass of water where you add a drop at a time and then there is a point where it overflows. We cannot tell the precise moment when smallpox eradication became inevitable. But we can say it was during those magic years when this group was roaming around Africa. It was not before we went to Africa because no one knew if it could be done. And it was not after 1970, but by that time we had shown that it could be done. So what's the meaning of it all? Of course, for many people, it means they didn't get smallpox and measles, and that's very meaningful. They have now generations of children and grandchildren because of that. But the real meaning was even bigger. Dave Sensor once said that smallpox eradication refreshed public health, and that is no small thing. But it was even bigger than that. It showed that an international health goal was possible. It gave courage to global 
health workers. It gave credibility to WHO, a credibility that they strive to retain, but I can tell you a credibility they would not have achieved without CDC. Because, as we've heard, CDC mobilized over 300 people for the smallpox effort, and they were willing to make it a WHO success and not a CDC success. And that is not a small thing. CDC knew that that was happening at the time, and it's to the credit of Dave Sensor and Bill Watson and Don Millar and all the others that they were willing to spend CDC capital to allow WHO to have this success without ever demanding anything back from WHO. And it's the, to the credit of Hofton Mahler that he recognized this and was able to privately say thanks and also say he hoped we understood why he couldn't do that publicly. In those Cold War days, it would have only caused other difficulties. It continued a CDC foreign policy that Dave Sensor started that's little known and I might say is now lacking at CDC. Dave formed a committee and asked the question, what's the most important contribution CDC could make to global health? And the answer was, since we don't have large resources, the single most important thing we could do would be to loan some of our best managers to global health outside of CDC. And the decision was made to start with WHO Geneva. Over the years, that's exactly what CDC did. It detailed great people, not people that we were trying to retire or get rid of, great people to WHO. And so D.A. Henderson was on CDC's payroll all the time he was at WHO. And CDC did not ask to supervise those people. They were supervised at WHO. Rafe Henderson was paid for by CDC. Mike Merson, Bob Hogan, Jonathan Mann, and so forth. It is established a global relationship with WHO that was useful both to the United States and to the world. WHO was able to have good people, direct connections to CDC, and CDC in turn had direct information on what was happening in the world. Everyone benefited. Contrast that to the current dysfunctional situation. In April 2004, a letter from Bill Steiger in HHS went to WHO and said, any CDC person used by WHO, even for a meeting, now had to go to HHS in Washington and they would make the decision on who would attend that meeting. It makes absolutely no sense for global health so politics now trumps science in a way that I thought would never happen after our smallpox experience. But the meaning of this African program goes beyond smallpox eradication, WHO credibility, and a working relationship with WHO. The current outlook for global health builds exactly on what happened 40 years ago. And let me tell you, in global health, everything has now changed. Number one, there's a new understanding in this country of what global health is about. Altruism has always been an ingredient, but now there's a palpable understanding that we're all in this together. There's an understanding that health is a crucial factor in development, and macroeconomists such as Jeff Sachs and Amartya Sen make the case for us. Immigration concerns even become involved. If one looks at Norway 125 years ago, it becomes clear why so many immigrants went from Norway to the United States. Why doesn't that happen now? Because Norway became a land of opportunity, and the ultimate answer to immigration from other parts of the world is to make them places of opportunity, and health is part of the equation. You will recall that we always had to make the case for how the U.S. would benefit when we asked for things in global health. I looked recently at a proposal we did for Clayton Curtis for an expansion of smallpox and measles, 
and it's riddled with justifications on what it would mean for the United States. This has all changed. Last fall at the Global Health Summit, Bill Clinton and Bill Gates were being interviewed and Bill Gates was asked, why should an American with a mortgage to meet every month and car payments worry about global health? And Gates answered, quote, because it's the right thing to do. So we can make the case for development, improve markets, American benefits, but we don't need to. It's the right thing to do. Add to this new understanding of global health what's happening with tools, and I don't have to spend time on that, but the new vaccines, hepatitis B, more stable measles vaccines, H flu, and now rotavirus and human papillomavirus coming out just in these months. We now have two anti-cancer vaccines that will make a difference in the developing world. We have drugs that are so safe they can be used on a mass basis. We think of AIDS drugs, of course, but there's also mectazan and albendazole and praziquantel and zithromax, things we didn't have 40 years ago when we went to Africa. And that's just the beginning. We will see over the next decades new drugs, new vaccines, new diagnostics that will change the gap between the rich and the poor countries. Bill Gates predicts that over the next 20 years we will have understood and made definite inroads into the top 20 infectious disease problems of the developing world. Add to that resources. Warren Buffett's gift is just the latest example. When we went out, global health was always resource poor, and that's changed in the last five years. The interest, it's not just the core group anymore. It used to be we knew everybody in global health, and now that's not true. So we have the economists and the researchers and the NGOs by the thousands and even politicians with little understanding of the world are actually giving money to global health. It's an unusual time. The program 40 years ago is part of what made this all possible. We didn't actually know we could eradicate smallpox. And at the same time, we never doubted it. Isn't that interesting? We were optimists. The trouble with being an optimist, of course, is that people think you don't know what's going on. But we did. And in the words of Harlan Cleveland, what characterizes global health people is, quotes, unwarranted optimism. Julie Richmond, former Surgeon General, said smallpox was eradicated because CDC sent out people too young to know they couldn't do it. I grew up with the saying, some things have to be seen to be believed, and the African program did just the opposite. It showed that some things have to be believed in order to be seen. So the implications of the West African program are still being realized, and they get greater every year. They follow the instructions of Leonard Sheely, Surgeon General from 1948 to 1956, who said, the world cannot be allowed to exist half healthy and half sick. There are lots of other lessons. Not only did we learn that global approaches are possible, but we were pioneers in global health globalism. Another lesson, we've heard it several times today, global health is actually more about management than it is about science. And a key ingredient is problem solving and that's why public health advisors work so well in Africa and then work so well in Asia. So it's one of the attributes shared by this entire group. You are all problem solvers. The other attribute was tenacity. Tenacity won't always bring success, but it's the only thing that will. And I often tell students about Mae West, who once described the suitor as so tenacious, she said he was the kind of man a woman would have to marry just to get rid of. <laughs> and that's the kind of tenacity this group showed. We learned that there's no substitute 
for involvement on the ground. We went not knowing what we were doing. And by being on the ground, we figured it out. But also, there's no substitute for headquarters support. This is a story of continuity from central level to the field. And it would be wrong to credit the field staff for smallpox disappearing from West and Central Africa. Don Millar, Billy Griggs, the entire staff at CDC, as Dave Sensor mentioned last night, were there to enable this work to be done. As we heard last night and we heard this morning, and you're going to hear once again, the real hero was Dave Sensor. Dave Sensor always found a way to provide people, equipment, support in creative ways. I used to think, but I never said until this moment, sometimes in creative, indictable ways. <laughs> it's time that he becomes a sung hero of smallpox eradication instead of the unsung hero, and this meeting is finally doing that. I've often said that he never turned down a single request that we made, and the burden that placed on me when I was in India to be sure what I was asking for because I knew I would get it. So Dave was right in saying, yes, it took the entire CDC, but it's the director that sends, sets the tone and those were years of dedication, and those were years of high morale. Two months ago, I took part in a program at the University of Colorado to honor one of my mentors. Charlie Houston, at the age of 93, had just received an honorary degree. And some of you may know Robin Houston, who worked at CDC, his son. And we had a half-day ceremony of tributes for Charlie. He had led the team that attempted to climb K2 in 1953, and they ended up attempting to rescue a sick climber in a storm which has become the stuff of legends in mountain climbing circles. Because as they tried to rescue this person, Six people ended up going down a 45 degree slope and they were totally out of control and they were saved by Peter Schoening and one ice axe at the right time. And Peter Schoening watched that rope get thinner and thinner as these six people were banging into each other and it held. And so there I was at the University of Colorado where the survivors had come back. Charlie at 93, Bob Bates at 95, former headmaster at Exeter, Bob Craig, one of the youngest ones in his late 80s, talking about what happened. And the point that they made was that, in truth, Peter Schoening was not just holding these people, but that rope went back to hundreds of people that were in support and all the way home. And that's what happened with the African program. And we recognized the long chain of support that went all the way home and tried to respond to every need in the field. Finally, the program has led to an entire new day in global health, but it's also established for all time that eradication is a goal worthy of our best efforts. But it, because it frees our grandchildren of a burden, and as far as we can see into the future, that's true. Eradication pushes the limits of our science and social organization. Eradication is an investment in the future rather than a debt we leave for our children. And it's true also for polio, and I agree with what Dave said. If you think it's hard to get 12 or 15 years of support for eradication, think of what it takes to get 100 years of support for control. Last year, our then seven-year-old grandson was sitting in the back seat of the car, at just the two of us, and he asked me a question that totally surprised me. He said, what's the most important thing people could do to make the world better? Well, when we were young, we rode in the front seat with our parents. Now, our children and grandchildren sit behind us and the dynamics have changed. And as I listened to his question, I thought to myself, 
as Americans, we see ourselves as marching into the future. That's our mental image. The ancient Greeks saw themselves as backing into the future because they couldn't see the future. And I thought to myself, this is a Greek story. My future is figuratively and literally behind me. And I get a glimpse in the rearview mirror and I hear some noise as he tries to get my attention to focus on the future, what's the most important thing, and so forth. But isn't that interesting? And I thought to myself, 40 years ago, the group in this room was sitting in the back seat and surprised the world with a message of joy, saying the world can be better, and you can back into the future with new confidence. Gregory Burns has written a book called Satisfaction, the Science of Finding True Fulfillment, and writes, happiness and pleasure are passive emotions that come from things that happen to you. But satisfaction is a positive emotion you experience because of things you made happen yourself. And I hope you take great satisfaction in recalling how you made this all happen. Recall it often because a happy memory never wears out. The work of this group 40 years ago continues to refresh the global health community. Thank you.